I'm Barbara Gutierrez. It's a real pleasure to host the next panel. Influence economics behind the scenes from the digital influencer business. A chat about influence, business, and games to address the view of different market professionals of what it's like to work on a daily basis with the uh, economics of influence in Brazil. Bearing in mind, this is a panel originally in Portuguese, but you can watch it in English. Just check out our web link. Uh, so I'm going to call an incredible woman, a moderator, Gianna Zambrozuski, content creator at Zambrocorp. If you don't know Diana, she's one of the greatest uh, female streamers of Facebook gamers, 6.3 million followers in social networks. She's hosted the Corujão program at Jovem Pan Radio, BGS, CCXP. So she stands out for storytelling, having worked with McDonald's, Fanta, LG, Old Spice, and so many others. How you doing, girl? Hey, Barbara. Hey, I miss you so much. This is so cool. Thank you for the opportunity of being here to talk about such an important topic, uh, which we don't talk so much about, you know. Folks see all of our, uh, you know, blings and stuff around here, but it's, it's like, you know, nobody really knows, you know, the backstage, you know, so only those who work with that really know what it's all about. So it's nice to have this this uh, opportunity. Yeah, the backstage, you know, we have to talk about it. We have to show it out into the world. Don't think it's just all fun and games. No. <laughs> Diane, thank you for being here, Diana. Uh, you have the screen. Oh, this is so good. So as we were saying, uh, we're going to discuss about the backstage of influencing. And this is all very hush-hush, you know? We see the influencers posting their uh, ads, but nobody, you know, really knows the size of the backstage, you know, the support, so many people involved. And even brands who work with us, uh, they're just sometimes starting to uh, do business with influencers. So even for brands, it's interesting to talk about these topics. And those of us who work with this, who live it every day, we have stories to tell. I have a wonderful team here. I'm extremely happy to be right next to these people, incredible people in the industry. It's a great honor to say that they're my friends, right? So I'm going to start um, introducing our guests over to you. And right after that, we're going to uh, hold a, a chat, you know, just like if we were at <laughs> a bar, you know, having a good chat. So to kick it off, we're going to have uh, Ed Gama. Uh, he's from Alagoas. He's a comedian, content creator for the Internet. He's, uh, you know, soft, finite, shining box, buzzer, skull, sports scotch, and so many other brands. And we know him, you know, all the Internet, you know, he produces great content. And he also uh, works with stand-up comedy, you know, throughout Brazil. And, and it's going to be great uh, conversation. And, you know, myself, Cherry, Giovanna and Luis we're more in gaming but it's great to have this uh you know this other side you know Ed to bring some humor this is Ed Gama how you doing Ed hey good evening uh Diana it's great to be invited to talk a bit I hope you guys uh enjoy this conversation as you said it's just like a chat over uh you know if we were at the bar it's gonna be a great opportunity to exchange experiences of course a cool thing I'd like to mention in his resume, he's the best guy to uh, impersonate Faustão, uh, our host here in Brazil on Sundays. So, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you an exclusive at the end. Oh, now, folks, you know, they're going to wait until the very end to get Ed impersonating Faustão. Now I'm going to introduce you Luizinho. Luiz Menezes is 21 years old entrepreneur he founded trope an accelerator of influencers of generation z and so how to push uh digital natives uh in you know he's in communication for five years since he was born he's a whiz kid you know great projects with pondes of disney oi mice we know that 
Luis is here working with us right in the backstage. Truly, I've been here for many years working with Luis. It's a great honor. And uh, he's known, you know, by the backstage folks. You know, it's it's great to to have the agency side you know, the advertising agency. And then, so he knows both sides, you know, the client side and the influencer side. So, uh, so, Luis, how you doing? Oh, come on, I'm embarrassed with this whole fabulous introduction. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm stoked to be here with uh, so many incredible people in the industry. Here we go. <laughs> All right, Lulu, he's a lifesaver. So now I'm going to introduce you. Nicole Mir, known as Cherry Gums. Cherry Gums. She is the CEO of Black Dragons, one of the largest esports teams uh, in Brazil. Elected by Forbes under 30, one of the highlights of, of her generation at the age of 22. We know that Nicole, when we started thinking about this presentation, the first name that popped, you know, let's think about a girl from esports and who's really you know talks about business you know who's in the business thing you know nicole is the right person so it's a wonderful presence she's always ahead of the game you know she, oh man cutting edge nicole cherry gums hey hey long time no see thanks for the invite here at the panel edge gum uh, luis uh, barbara if you're watching uh, <laughs> big kiss this is great to see you guys again. Well, miss, you know, those in-person events. Now I'm going to introduce Multi Girl BR. Multi at the age of 19. She's an entrepreneur, content creator. She has a gameplay channel, uh, over 2 million uh, subscribers. She uh, creates the movement Be Multi for uh, professional and personal development. And we know as an entrepreneur at 19, she never worked in the traditional uh, marketplace, but she owns, you know, a Minecraft channel, you know, a big time, a full schedule and a lot of track record to share about uh, content creation and how to monetize uh, the networks. Uh, so she's a whiz kid. Hey, folks from the stream, pleasure being here. Uh, thanks for the invite. And we're here to talk about this uh, subject that is an everyday thing for us, right? Yes, we have a lot to share. It's really interesting. Uh, these are chats that we only have when there's an event and we meet influencers and we can finally, uh, you know, chat some back and forth, you know, just to, uh, you know, feel the water, you know, what what the industry is like, how, what the brands are, are doing. And it's usually restricted to those uh, in-person chats, those closed circles. We, we, we don't even open it up. Even in live streams, I'm going to uh, have some conversations conversations in terms of uh, what, what is an ad if you receive a gift, you know, oh, this is this is swag, you know, so so how do you work with that, you know, so uh, there's lots to be, uh, um, you know, shared here. So to introduce this, I've, I've introduced all of you. Uh, it's cool. So I'm going to ask a basic question for you to summarize, you know, how you started, how you how you came to be here today. And then uh, segueing into our backstage conversation, when did the switch flip? You know, this is not just a, a play anymore. This is serious. This is this is a, a profession, you know, responsibilities. And then the red tape comes, you know, you have to open a company, you have to send invoices. How did you manage all that? Now, Nicole is here on the screen. Who wants to kick it off to, to begin the conversation? I can begin. Um, so when did it flip the switch? Uh, I have two companies, one as Cherry Gums and the other as Black Dragon. So the switch flipped uh, when I had to start paying salary to the players. So I noticed it was not even uh, the the ads that I was running, the relationship with the brands and the campaigns. Um, it was the responsibility I had to third parties. And then it really flipped the switch, you know, the game, when the players started saying, you know, come on, you have to increase the salary. I can't, you know, in the beginning of uh, esports, you know, what, five, six years ago, this was not so 
professional as it is today. So people played for fun, but today you can't, you know, this is a, these are athletes, that's their profession. So when they started becoming athletes, having salaries, I saw a 19 year old girl, you know, that's a profession. <laughs> Wow, that's cool. And uh, I can imagine, you know, myself and many people uh, have a contact, you know, the contact with the brands and she had a whole team, you know, an organization to take care of. That must have been some switch that you flipped, you know, uh, you know, being careful of the stuff that I that I would say, you know, the stuff I would uh, would post. Now the client sees all that, you know, not just my friends, you know, you have to you, you just, we were just, you know, having fun before with content, you know, that was some, some serious people are going to start watching this. And so it's interesting. So let's move over to Edgy, maybe Ed. Yeah, why not? Uh, I had a bit of a different story because I came from the offline to the online world. I was a stand-up comedian and uh, that's how my career started. And because I knew lots of people who would post their stand-up videos on the internet and both on YouTube and Facebook, and I started understanding how that worked and then uh, started creating content uh, focused on the internet per se. And, and that flipped the switch uh, during the offline phase. Um, one of these shows, I uh, can't remember exactly the client I think it was a bank and uh, I had to uh, play a show that's focused on the bank a topic that they gave me and so when I was uh, had an opportunity uh, to show my online content to that very same uh, client their demand was okay so you could do the same thing you did offline but now you can do it online for us uh, to us, you create the same content you created before so that our platforms can use. And that was my first contact with a level of responsibility as a, a an actual content creator um, because I couldn't protect myself only on the offline world, you know, say whatever I wanted. I was talking to the entire country, to to all the employees of the bank, a whole network of the bank. So, so the switch you know, flipped, you know, like I'm a content creator. I'm a co online content creator. I have to be responsible. And that's when it hit me. You know, I started showing my stand-up content uh, on YouTube. And I think that was when it flipped because then I never stopped producing and, and there were other contents, not just the stand-up, you know. Um, you've participated even there with uh, contents uh, I, I create and Wow, that is so cool. That must have been interesting, you know, from offline to online. So you already worked with that and, and have you brought that to the internet? That probably uh, clicked so many new things for you, you know, seeing the reaction of so many people. Sometimes the content that I do on live streams, uh, uh, there's a lot of freedom. And, and then when I post something, I have to filter uh, I can imagine coming from the offline to the online. It's interesting, you know, and you started with like a bank. Wow. <laughs> imagine the red tape, you know, all the piles of, of paper, you know, you had to sign and stuff. Anyway, let's move over to Luis Menezes. Lulu, tell us how you started in this industry and how did, when did you feel that it was a professional thing? Oh, wow. I miss face-to-face -face events, you know, that's what we had, you know, on, on the hallways going this way and that way, you know, we would uh, talk and, but my story was a bit different. I started in 2016, uh, hiring artists and influencers for pop and nick culture in the countryside. And that's when I met you, actually, uh, Gianna and tens of creators. And, uh, but we could see for those folks that started off on the digital, the internet, most, they didn't have an agent. They didn't have somebody to represent them. You, you would talk straight to the creator and they would uh, charge very low figures and, and and they had never dealt with the admin side. You know, they took long to, to reply. In 2017, I said, there's an opportunity. I see this here out in the market. So I went into the artistic uh, agency uh, side. And today, the only creators that I... Uh, it's Gabriel Pato uh, and 2021, I founded Tropi and Tropi is not an agency, it's an accelerator. It's, it's being the 
arm of, of Generation Z for the brands, for them to create communication plans and to foster the market with educational content. You know, they're saying, oh, let's make uh, creators professional for them to understand as a business for the, for the market to hire us also uh, much more. That's great. And we're going to be talking a bit more about agencing, but let's introduce Xi. Xi, you're so young. I imagine that you started just for fun, right? You were just posting your gameplays and then there you are. You're, you're working with it. You're making a living. So when did that uh, switch flip? Yeah, I really started really early. I was 13 when I became a YouTuber. In the beginning, it was about having fun. I used my mom's computer for the videos. When she got home from work, I would borrow it. And I started doing it for fun and because I liked talking. When things changed was when I realized that I had to post more. I couldn't only post once a week or three times a week. I had to post a video a day which is what everyone was saying worked at the time. That's when I realized that I had to get organized and I needed to um, you know, make things very well organized. I had to define my process to really be able to deal with school and also my channel. That's when I realized that it was different, that I had to pay attention to it. That was it. That's interesting. It was little by little, right? What was fun became a job. So when you uh, looked at it again, you were making a living. That's interesting. So still talking on uh, beginnings, maybe we should talk about agency. That's controversial. Yeah, but that's exactly when people become professionals, right? That's when it flips the switch. When you have a full schedule, should you, uh, you know, take care of it? Am I presenting myself well? Because agents are paid for it, right? And in the beginning, you do a little bit of everything. You take care of your own schedule. And in the beginning, you know, I believe that everyone else here answered their own emails, just as I did. And I have a fun story to tell. And in the beginning, I found out that answering my emails with my own signature was not working so well because I wanted to stand for myself, but I didn't know how to say, no, This, these are her terms. This is how much she charges. You can't do much. So how was I going to say it face to face with the client? We know how difficult it is to say no, to say that you don't want to, you know, we give our most, but at some point, you need to also um, see the value in yourself. So I started um, presenting myself as a different person. I made a different email, and that persona was my manager. Um, much better than uh, what I could do for myself. So it really changed how it worked. It become became much more uh, professional, and then at some point, I no longer was able to answer as much as I could or even, you know, put proposals together uh, as well as I should. And that's when Luis came in and started taking care of my uh, things. We started little by little. He at some point said, you know, all right, you, you do it. You're going to do it much better than me. And that's how it worked for me. But how did it work for you when did your um, managers step in? Could we keep in the same order? It doesn't matter. All right, I'll tell you how it worked with me. I still answer my emails along with my manager. Of course, um, they send the budget, but I'm always copied to every email because actually I think this is a good tip. It's always important to be transparent with your agent and with you. So Gianna said that, you know, you might not, um, you, not might, you might not want to say that this is not your price and someone else is going to uh, make it much better. But 
as a content creator, if you're small and even if you're big, don't forget to be in the loop. Don't forget to be there for the negotiations because even if you have an exclusive contract with your agent, the best way of having transparency is to be in the loop in the negotiations. You might be BCC'd into the email. It doesn't need to necessarily show your name, but with me, that was this was basically what happened. You said that you started uh, answering as a with an alias. I didn't do that, but when I started my journey in 2016, I started in an agency. I had a PR manager there, and he started doing it for me. So. I wasn't in the loop with the emails and I, I had some uh, problems since I wasn't uh, reading those emails. And only after a long time, um, I discovered I should have been in the loop because a lot of people can uh, do you wrong. So I left that agency and started negotiating my contracts and my sponsorships. And it was earlier this year that I started doing it again with the agency. I wasn't able to handle it. I had a thousand things to do, and now I have Danilo and Out of the Mug, which is another company. I have two uh, agents, but Danilo is my uh, dear friend. Yeah, he's a great person. That's right. So do, this is my tip. Don't leave your products and your content on someone else's hand. No one's going to know what your value is more than you. And no one's going to know what you do better than you. So always try to be in the loop. That's it. Yeah, that's a great point you raised. I remember when I began, when I was still really young, when I was just having my first um, ads, I started working with an agency. I was only there for a couple of months. And then I started answering for myself because I felt I had um, you know, lost touch. I no longer saw any negotiations. I really felt out of the loop. So that was an interesting point. I don't know if this is worth mentioning, but recently we saw there was an article published. I think everyone heard about it. I'm gossiping here, but there was an influencer who was huge. I think everyone knows about it, right? Uh, her name is Boca Rosa. She was huge. I don't know. So to uh, lay that gossip on me, girl. But it was it was something that was uh, talked about a lot. She had an agent who was a former manager of Anita, the pop singer, and she only found out later that she was being sold in packages with other influencers that were nothing like her. So this agent was only closing the deal with her if uh, she got other people in the package along with her. So imagine for a small influencer, being caught in a situation like that is likely because it happens to something to someone huge like this influencer. So I try to uh, speak to my manager all day. We're very transparent. We work together at everything, but there are many strict agencies in our um, in our world that you only hear of things when the deals are closed and you don't know anything else. So it's always important to be in the loop. Let's con continue with the list. Ed, what stories do you have to tell us about being managed by a PR company? Yeah, before I go there, uh, just to continue what, on what you're saying, when I started to, you know, have more events, when I became more relevant, I, I, I had a contract with a major agency and I thought that was going to change my career. I thought that was going to be my big break, but it wasn't, it really wasn't. And I realized something and I'm not sure if it was only my experience or if everyone else has, ha has had something like that, but I realized that oftentimes there's an illusion that if you're in a big agency, things will be different. But sometimes big agencies are not so worried about you. They might be worried about 
you know, major influencers that they're handling. So my turning point on this was when I got together with a friend who is still my manager today, was someone who, you know, was already a good intermediator with other influencers. And we decided to have a partnership and start our own company. So now I'm a manager for myself because my company manages my career. For a long time, I was worried about having a major agency and I want to be you know, in the same agency as a celebrity, but that never uh, made it better for me. They weren't focused on me. They were focused on the other major influencers they had. You know, that, so this dream about, you know, being with this agency, being represented by this ag other agency, that should not be your uh, focus. That's probably not going to get you uh, very far. It's easier for them to have a major influencer because brands want these big influencers. So their work is much more passive. They only get the demand. But when you're small and when you're starting out and when you need... Um, a bigger wheel for your career to turn. You need an active manager. You need to present ideas. You need to create things. You need to pursue a sponsor because it's very difficult for a sponsor to come to you because you're still not relevant. So it's very important to have someone who has the same way of thinking as you, who you know everything about, but it needs to be split. You're a content creator. Your work needs to be to create content. If you're too worried about being um, a manager and knocking on doors, you're not going to create content. So if you're not creating content, you're no longer attractive for a company or a likely uh, sponsor. So it's important to have a manager to work on it, but don't forget to create your own content and don't forget to do what you do on social media, on Twitch, on YouTube. If you're able to find someone who has a similar drive to you and 90% of the cases, this is not going to be in a major agency. I think this is the best case for you. This is the person who's going to focus on your career and create strategies for you. And that's when projects appear, especially with micro influencers. We're all big, but we've all been micro influencers before, right? So we know we've often had to start projects for and create things for this these markets. Yeah, you raised two interesting points, Ed especially when you're starting out, it's uh, easy to be fooled by, you know, big agencies who are now going to give you all the best jobs. But oftentimes you might be put in a basket along with um, others and no one's really looking after you. They're only, you, you know, sending you uh, some things and sending your picture but without going deep into everything you can do and treating you as just another name, just another uh, number. So that's an interesting point that you raised. Sometimes smaller agencies will give you more visibility, will go deep into your numbers and show your true potential. And you also raised the point that, yes, you can be a manager for yourself, but how will you create content then? We can't do everything. We want to, of course, uh, create our own videos, edit them, reply to our own emails, take care of our schedule, but we need to hand it off to other people and that will allow us to do what we do best, which is to create content. So having a manager is always good. Now the next one on the list is Lulu, who's going to tell us about that. Luis is the guy who works on both sides of the uh, the, the market, right? He has clients, he's also a manager, and he's going to tell us a bit about that. 
Yeah, I'm just drinking everything that uh, everyone's saying. What's the coolest thing is to see how much there are no rules. You know, everyone has their own experience on what, what happened to them based on their track record. It's important to bring those stories to the table, to share, to discuss and say what didn't work, what did. But the most important thing is uh, segueing with what Cherry and, and Ed mentioned. Let's work, uh, you know, teamwork, you know, both sides, you know, you and the person you represent, you know, you have to be in the loop and, and there has to be a transparent relationship and to have great alignment in terms of business goals, business objectives. What's most important, it's, there's no rule like, oh, I have to be in an agency or, you know, there are, there are people who being in an agency, it, it works for them. It's what Ed mentioned, uh, he attracts or she attracts the bland, uh, brands. So the agency, it's more like the, commer the, the commercial negotiation, but there are many cases, and I like to remind this to uh, beginner influencers, and even those who are a bit more mature, they have a significant a viewership, uh, 500,000 followers. One thing is to have 500,000 followers on the internet is another thing is to be known in the advertising uh, industry. That's different things. Those who are in the advertising industry, those who represent brands working in the agencies who select the names and present those names to the brands usually are older people. They're not people who are there in the gaming ecosystem. And that's why why it's important for someone to actively be offering, uh, uh, bringing things to you. The number of times I've talked and even my own stories talking to other influencers, many times we begin a relationship with an agency, with a brand, and that's going to become a business after six months, a year later, because uh, at an event, at a meeting or something that we had 30 minutes to, to pitch and, 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 and present that uh, influencer's profile, the person Remembered, you know, they said, oh, and months go by, they say, oh, Diana or Cherry, you know, those are people I want. I remember, you know, they, they, they're they involved with entrepreneurship. And so uh, it, it's worth for this moment and this action. So so building that relationship with the marketplace, it's it's continuous and it has to be uh, uh, something in the influencer's mind, but we can't handle everything. So we have to learn uh, to delegate, as Cherry mentioned, you know. Uh, she was hiring people, you know, being responsible for paying people's salaries. And at the same time, it's more people involved in your in your process, you know, people who are doing stuff for you. It's interesting what you brought uh, to the table, you know, the long term. Sometimes you don't close the deal right there and then, but uh, uh, some campaign in the future, they're going to remember, you know, the whole relationship with a PR, uh, you know, the, the content creator, him or herself. Uh, another interesting point for small creators, it's the uh, flip, you know, when I remember when I went through this moment, oh, I'm going to have a, a PR, you know, we have a cake, which in the beginning, it's not that big. And a small slice of that cake is going to go as a commission to the PR uh, when you start working with uh, with someone. And then you, you think about that, you say, oh, come on, wouldn't it be worth, you know, uh, uh, it was just about saying a yes on an email, but many times it's it's there's a negotiation. It's going to go for months on end before it closes. And then the PR is going to be right there, even without getting the commission of a job that's not done yet, uh, closed yet. Or maybe uh, the PR is there for a full year talking to the client and then it, it doesn't close the deal. So, so, so it's not just a one-off uh, a thing, you know, X, Y, Z, done deal or not. And now we're going to go over to Giovanna G, this, this prodigy girl, this young, how, how did that work for you? You know, the PR uh, manager, how did, when did you feel that you need those extra arms? To be honest, you know, that part on PR, I, I don't have a lot of experience uh, because a lot of this PR thing, I did it myself and my parents always helped me a lot. So that's the first thing. And an interesting uh, other thing, my audience is very, uh, it's children. Uh, and we have difficulty with uh, uh, ads for, for children. There are lots of restrictions. So it was more complicated for a brand to come and seek me out for a partnership. But I remember there was a traumatic experience with an agency. Um, it was like, I remember first call that I held with the agency, they said, but you shouldn't be known by 
multi girl. You you should bring your name. And the first call, they 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 wanted to like, they wanted to change my whole image, and, and that was like it's important the multi because there's there's a whole underlying concept that I like you said, you know, to be multi, you know, and so that's important. My first experience with this PR uh, thing, it was negative. It was very negative. Yeah, it's like stupid. I We have Vitubi, is her name Vitubi. She was on Big Brother here in Brazil. It's, you know, Big Brother, come on. Yeah, but I remember it was the first thing they told me. I was in shock, you know, I was going like, it was a huge agency and the I had this idea, like Ed, you know, like he said, oh, I was dazzled, you know, oh my God, a big agency is seeking me out and stuff. Remember the first call? It was like, I heard that and I told my dad, he said, what do you mean? They they told you that? They said, yeah, dad, that's that's what happened. Yeah, traumas, traumas, traumas. Yeah, but today I have a great agency, Lexi agency. So I'm having a, a good experience with them after that. But that's crazy, you know, because at some point that's that's gonna happen. Some some huge agency is gonna uh, it's gonna dazzle us, you know. We're gonna see we have potential. You can become something, and 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 you're gonna think that that's gonna change your life. And I'm sure, you know, when when I uh, agreed to go to that agency, I was sure it was gonna change my life, and nothing happened. Absolutely nothing. Because they were much more in terms of receiving you rather than going after it, you know, making it happen. It's better to have somebody that uh, is on the same page with you, you know, somebody who's focused on you, uh, focused on creating projects uh, uh, alongside you. That's why it's important to bring uh, all that was being said here together. You know, uh, we, we call it to do it in four hands, you know, uh, all together, teamwork and somebody on the same page, you know, not just being dazzled by the by the uh, figures of the company. Ed, can I ask you a question? When, I'm not gonna mention the name of the agency, but what year? Why am I asking it? Because what I felt out in the marketplace, uh, I, in media, I joined about 2016. So 2016, 17 and 18 were years when were agencies that received and did not look for anything. It, large ones, even some that bankrupted digital stars, uh, Mark Leni, uh, with the same agent as I am, Danilo. So back then, I remember I was called to my agency. It was good back then. So was it around that period of time? Yeah, around that, that time. And I had exposure on Fausto. I was hired by Global TV, the uh, largest program on Sunday TV. So especially comedians. And so, you know, false, and, and nothing happened. I couldn't uh, gain traction. You know, I, I think it, it was the trend back then of agencies. Be, but I remember the, the you don't have to, to tell me the year, uh, but uh, it, it was a trend of agencies just to receive, but not to seek after. It was a trend. There was a transition also. Uh, even if we are to put on a timeline, this uh, art uh, agency market came from actors and actresses and musicians, which is a widely consolidated market. And so many PR agencies who had exclusivity with actors and artists, um, um, uh, uh, they started flipping the switch. They started bringing influencers into their cast because they saw there was potential people who didn't understand about business, but who had great viewership. Yeah, and all of a sudden, you know, comes that uh, agency that's so square, you know, they're used to hire an actor, deliver a script, a, a, and then there's an influencer who's got their personality, you know, posting something that makes no sense at all, you know. We see everything come from PR agencies. And so finding people to work with you, it's a marriage. It's something so difficult. You know, we hear ridiculous things from agencies and from people, and people we hold in high esteem. You know, I, I thought there were people who were helping me and they say things like, oh, you had to you have to say less and show yourself more you know come on it's the opposite i, I want to be known by my personality not but you know just show some skin you know they wanted to change your name i love multi girl oh my god it's it's it is 
powerful, you know, it's multi, you know, come on. It's a funny story. Um, you know, we're moving along a nice uh, timeline here in terms of how we started, when it flipped the switch to be more professional, the responsibility, the PR. One more question I wanted to pose before we go into the uh, Q&A session. Uh, it's about the work itself. And uh, when the opportunity came, uh, it's a briefing, you know. You know, it's like an actor. They want you to read that. You know, you could read in five minutes there, yeah, and they want 15, okay? And then there's a whole briefing. And, uh, and then there's a, like a blank briefing so we don't have a lot of uh, guidelines to where to go so so how do you manage the uh, how to create uh, advertising you know the ads do you do you discuss the ideas you go into the creative side with the brand and have you gone through experiences where you had to compromise then you had to post something that was you know uh, boxed priorly uh, and sometimes we have no no opportunity to change it the client wants us to post this and this and that Dude, I know my audience. I know how to communicate this. I wanted to do this differently, but and then it doesn't work. I wanted to know from you. So, so how do you deal with that? Um, if you've uh, done deals where you wanted to change it a bit more, how, how how do you deal with that? You know, in terms of of the briefings and content creation together with a brand. Let's begin with Cherry on my uh, order. Yeah, it's like a pool table thing here. It's like a bar table. <laughs> So it really depends on the brand and the campaign. Uh, today I have my sponsors and more than that, I have a consulting contract. I provide consulting over to Unbev, so InBev. So all the fusion actions, not all actions, but most of large campaigns or large ideas that fusion has, there's a bit of a cherry touch there. <laughs> Let's call so-and-so influencer. We're gonna launch a project X, so we talk to each other, the, the group of consultants and brand ambassadors, we, we talk to the brand and, but there are uh, campaigns that are so square, you know, um, that leave no room for leeway. You know, brands today understand it's not the brand speech, it's the influencers speech. The, they're buying the influencers uh, viewership, their contact with their uh, audience. Uh, they're, they're not buying, uh, uh, you know, what the brand can say through the influencers mouth. But maybe what three or four years ago, uh, it was so tight, you know, you had a, a 50 line text, you have to speak in 15 seconds on stories. It's like a three stories combo. And it's like a testimonial, a whole thing, you know. Yeah, in TV advertising. Yeah, it's just like a surgeon's surgeon's warning, you know, just don't take this medication if you have this and this and that. You know, I've, I've run campaigns with Ed for Ponto Frio. There was a bit of a script for you to follow, but uh, I always done that in uh, ad campaigns and in negotiations, in, in talks. I always bring my opinion to the table. I'm well known in the advertising industry to, to bring my fingerprint. I understand my audience and especially I understand my scene. Uh, you know, I, I sell knowing my scene to the brands. It's a consulting service. I sell my brain. People want to pick my brain. You know, they want to know about the gaming industry and I know a lot about it. So, so I want to teach the brand not to be a dolphin brand, just one show and bye-bye. I want to teach them how to become, uh, you know, true. So there's always my fingerprint there. But in the past, when I didn't have that knowledge, I just did it you know but little by little you know i understood that you know uh, just buy lipstick Nah, i don't want to follow this girl anymore no so 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 uh it, it's 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 not honest you know uh, uh paid ads you know like that sometimes yeah you put your soul into it. it it's what makes it worth it and make companies uh and brands understand this ever more what about you ed uh, it's something recent, you know, uh, not too long ago, nobody wanted to hear what we have to say. And uh, uh, we had to deliver what they wanted to be delivered. But uh, in the recent past, you know, it's it's a matter of cycles, I think. Uh, you, you start creating a new way of, of advertising, of marketing. Um, companies that were used to 
advertising on radio and TV, they discovered that the internet doesn't have the same language. So it's no use running a formal ad that the audience, you know, the viewership, you know, I talk about my content. I, I'm a, this, this audience for humor, they, oh, I have this glass. It's a wonderful, no, no, this doesn't work anymore. You know, this language doesn't work on the internet. And especially, uh, you know, you guys who have content focused on gaming content, how are you gonna talk about a refrigerator you know, like uh, it's something that it, it just doesn't work, you know. So uh, as Cherry mentioned, uh, we have to seek this opportunity out. That's what is getting the industry, advertising industry to change. I had recent experiences. Um, my content, as it is a humor content, uh, I have to always be... Uh, uh, I have to evolve it. It has to be relevant in time. I have to be talking about what's happening around the world. So there were some cases now. Big Brother Brazil was a case uh, in my content stream. And, and the brands that came to advertise uh, with me, I was able to mash up the contents of certain brands such as iFood, for example. Um, and I was able to bring it over to what the type of humor I was talking about, Big Brother. So I ran an iFood campaign where I would impersonate the participants of Big Brother and that worked well, you know, and it reached, uh, you know, my audience. It really connected to my audience. And so uh, sometime in the future now, I saw Cherry talking about Ambev, but but now we're partners, Cherry, at, at Ambev. I'm, I'm with Skull, Skull for Raw. Dance. So when the San Juan parties come in the Northeast, it's it's a big thing. I'm going to change my content according to that time of the year. So I'm going to start talking about the Forró dance. And all of that were things that I had to carve out. You know, sometimes this is the, the script. This is what, no, this is doesn't match. To, can I deliver what you want to say, but uh, impersonating so-and-so from Big Brother, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's trying to use uh, the strategy of what you're used to creating your content to deliver what the brand wants you to deliver. So um, we have to put, you know, uh, Chip and Dale to work, you know. <laughs> so it's, it's no, what's going to get the, the brand to be loyal to you, what's going to get the brand to want to advertise with you again, it's the love, the care that you're going to put into that. If you deliver an ad with excellent figures that really uh, hit on your content, you know, the brand's going to do all the deals with you. And so, yeah, to me, what's most important is that uh, bringing it over to your universe, whether it is just a way of saying things, just a, a way of in, uh, 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 just, you know, making a joke or something, but it's got to be the way that Diana looks, Ed, Multi, and Cherry. It's got to, I see this action here that I have seen in 50 different creators. However, this one looks like Diana. Yeah, your community, right? Yeah. That's right. I'm very careful when I create branded content because first, if I don't have the brands, I don't. I won't have anything for lunch. I won't have food on my table. So I need to be careful on how I deliver because they need to understand that I care and so that they want to continue doing things with me. That's right. We feel that some brands want us to be there posting a content with a banner that doesn't relate to our content. So it's always great that when we can include our personality in an ad. I agree, I like to make ad, an ad into a story so that people will watch that and not even feel it so that it makes sense and it fits the content they're used to. So it's as organic as it can be. So creating a story with the brand, I love it when we have the uh, freedom to do that. I'm doing an ad for Old Spice now, and you know they really give you uh, the freedom to have fun, to create content that everyone's going to watch. Well, I think we're almost out of time. We only have five minutes. So I know that Muchi has uh, content that's more geared for kids. So I think she monetizes more through YouTube. 
I think if brands don't know how to deal with us, they probably don't know how to deal with uh, kids' content either. But let's hear from Multi. Yes, well, I have just a quick statement. I was very lucky. Oftentimes, there's a lot of text, and you have to reduce it to a single story, and it's just crazy. But I was very lucky on that. I always had a lot of creative freedom to uh, do ads. I remember one I made for Centauro Sporting Goods store, and they said, well, just create anything related to sports. They didn't give me anything, and I ended up doing something that really was a great fit uh, to my personality and what my audience likes. It was great. Yeah, she, that's amazing. And what I think about a lot is that, you know, influencers need to care for their community and they should not be afraid. I always say this to every content creator, uh, stand your ground. Don't be afraid of saying something to a brand or an agency that what they're saying is not good for your community. Your biggest concern and really the biggest asset that you have as an influencer is your community that took so long to build. The message I want to give you is, in influencers in general, when you have the business perspective, you can only look at your uh, ad revenue as the only source of income for your company. We know that ad revenue you know, 2020 was a year where we learned that it's uncertain. In a month, you might have a lot of revenue, but what about the next? And the pandemic, what happens? You know, why is the market giving influencers creative freedom? Because they understand that that gives their ads more visibility. That's what they're investing in. They're getting a greater return. So we understand that when something happens to the ecosystem, people are going to uh, go away. Like for example, Jun is, um, is a TV show host, Ed has his stand-up, Giovanna has um, a YouTube channel that you can also monetize through AdSense. So you need to have a more comprehensive perspective. People who are with you, your, entre your uh, managers, need to understand that there are different ways of creating revenue for your company so that you have a healthy uh, company long-term. You might get a campaign, you might have a, uh, the, the uh, stars in your eyes because of how much money it is, but what about in five months? What about in six months? So you need to think about things long-term. Five years is very uh, long for an influencer. Yeah, that's right. You're asking about uh, ne the next six months. Oftentimes, our um, ad campaigns are only paid after three months. So when you have the flexibility that we have online, you need to be ready and prepared for the next trend so that you can survive. You know, you're in a social network that might be doing well right now, but it might not be so uh, good in the next months. So it's a tightrope. You have to look and even the folks who work with us need to understand that we need to keep an eye out on things. We're running out of time, but I think we did uh, a great panel. We could be here for hours. We talked about how we started, when we started being managed and how we do our work. We got a question on contact. I often see that sometimes many emails we get is, well, I have a product and we'd like to have a partnership. We like descriptive emails. You know, we, we want to create an ad for our audience. So if you send us an email, it's great if you could tell us the most you can so that can facilitate our work so that our managers know what it's about, what the product is and so on and so forth. I wonder if we have time for more questions. I don't think we do. I think we have to say goodbye. Wow, we could be here for a long time. I'm sure we could, time just flew by, but I guess we have to get Barbara back and thank you uh, for this great conversation.
it's just like having like a water cooler conversation, right? We could be there for hours to talk about things, about different jobs. So it was great to see you guys again. I hope everyone enjoyed our conversation. And I hope that you could understand our side. We're always fighting to work well, but always to add our own character to our ads. And we hope that we can, you know, uh, hand things off to other people so that we can create our own content with our own look and so that our industry can grow more and become more professional. Yeah, that was a great conversation. Thank you, Ed, Louise, Mucha Girl, Cherry. I missed you. Nice to see you. You look beautiful. And especially Diana, who uh, moderated this session. Thank you for being here and thank you for the content that I'm sure will help everyone watching at home. We'll see you maybe at the next big, right? Next year, hopefully in person. Yes, we want the vaccine. Great, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, that was great. Thanks. That was wonderful. That was so great. Big Festival 2021, the biggest games festival in Latin America.